And one of those companies is IBM, International Business Machine, as it was originally called. It used to be known as Big Blue, after the color of the computers. They were blue in color. They gave us, IBM gave us punch cards, the floppy disk, the Skeletric Golf Ball Typewriter. And of course, those famous computers put, helped put man on the moon. Do you remember, you can see it in the movie Hidden Figures. Now, if you think IBM is a relic of the past, let me show you what's taking place inside its research center north of uh, New York City. I was there recently, and I met the company's director of research. He reminded me IBM is pushing to the forefront of AI and quantum computing. This is the uh, world's most advanced quantum computer. It's actually our next generation quantum system. So it's called IBM Quantum System 2 and is the building block of creating quantum supercomputers. This machine that you're seeing here behind is a fully functional quantum computer that has three of the most advanced quantum processors that have ever been built inside it and working. Give me an example of the sort of thing that this can do that you couldn't do before. Look, uh, the biggest category is simulating the physical world, the natural world. So people that want to do a chemistry calculation or a physics calculation or a materials calculation, like you want to build a better material that corrodes less because you're going to use it in an industrial process. So those kinds of calculations with classical machines are very, very difficult to do. What do you mean when you say it behaves like nature? It doesn't go tr grow trees. What do you mean? Well, uh, we know that there are fundamental forces in nature that uh, over the last, you know, 100 plus years, right, phys physicists have discovered. And one of the great discoveries over the last 100 plus years was uh, quantum mechanics. And we know that, you know, the way atoms behave and interact with one another can be described according to these uh, physical laws of quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And that's what I mean, that we know that nature behaves quantum mechanically, right? That this behavior that we've described with those equations is an accurate description of how atoms work with each other. What's the difference between a qubit and a bit? And I realize you're probably thinking this man's an idiot. No, no, no. Look, uh, these are like, you know, hard concepts to, to process. So these well, are well, not well, easy ideas, but the, here's, terms, the, here, here's the difference. A bit is a binary, the binary digit. It's just a zero or a one state. There's only two states. And what we do in the world of computing is we take all the knowledge on the world, the data, and we map that knowledge into zeros and ones, and then we process them through transistor-based technology, right, which are switches. In this world, you take information from the world and you encode it in a richer representation than the zero and one. You get to have more states than zero and one. And you can have combinations on zeros and ones. And, you know, it's a subtle approach of, like, bringing some ideas from physics to make that happen. At the bottom of the refrigerator, where the quantum processor sits, is one of the coldest places in the universe. How cold? 15 millikelvin. Very, very close to absolute zero. And, you know, over 100 times colder than outer space. And that cooling is essential for the functioning of this quantum computer. <laughs> Basically, inside this system, we have three of these, three quantum processors. Only three? And uh, yeah, for now only three, it's the most anybody has ever done. So we have three of them, um, but Where remember, is it? and um, it's, it's sort of hanging inside here, sort of mounted like that, yeah. and use three of them, and they're all connected, right, uh, with uh, cabling systems and so on that go out. And basically, the way it works is you're, whatever you are in the world, that uh, you write your program, you send go, it comes here, here it gets converted through the systems that are on this side, to microwave pulses, they travel down the cryostat, we create the, the cubits. The cryostat, what cryo a great stat, name. Isn't it? The cryostat. <laughs> so, right. so in this cryostat, at the very bottom of yeah. it, um, we form the qubits, and the qubits are inside here, and they're all doing the magic inside there. In the end, we perform a measurement, we amplify the signal, and we convert it back to zeros and ones, and in then you see it ma magically. In right? all of this, which is the most expensive bit, is it this? Yeah, building the quantum processor. This is the most important part of the technology. So what do they do? Is they ring you up and say, Jerry, I've got, an, I've got something I want to build a better steel, or I need this, that, and the other. How much will it cost to use your thingamajig? 
So we offer a few different approaches to do that. One method, uh, we partner with governments and, uh, and regions, and they put IBM quantum systems in there. So for example, we have deployed quantum computers in Japan, in South Korea, in Spain, in Canada, in Germany, and many in the United States. Are you betting the ranch on quantum? Look, uh, the way uh, Arvin Krishna, the CEO of IBM, describes it is that this is our big bet for the future. So today, the company is focused on hybrid cloud and AI. Those are the two defining you know, technologies of our time that we are focused like, you know, like a laser on bringing that capability to enterprises. The next one in our horizon after that is quantum. So what IBM is today is a hybrid cloud and AI company and it will become, as the technology matures, a hybrid cloud, AI and quantum company. What worries you about AI and uh, to some extent quantum, but that's still a bit further down there. What worries you? We have a problem in that universities are supposed to be really, really ahead, right, in the field. But because it's so computing intensive, AI, and they don't have enough computing capacity in universities, universities, even the very best ones, are falling behind this AI sort of um, field. And we need to be able to create new infrastructure to help our educational system advantage for AI. That's an example of it. At another level is that, that we don't end up in a situation of half and half knots. Oh. And we're, we're already there. I know, but like one of the things is how do we democratize the value creation dimension of AI? I like to say the AI strategy of a region, a country, an institution cannot be reduced to being an AI user. Meaning, you know, all you need from AI is just use it. And you're like, no, you also have to be an AI value creator. You have to actually know how to create these models, how to actually create value on top of it, because it's gonna be a massive source of competitive advantage. So the world cannot end up with just three, five firms who are the only ones who know how to create AI and no one else.